A very warm welcome to the 2021 annual conference of the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment, short GRASFI. My name is Christoph Nedopil and I'm the director of the Green Finance and Development Center at Fudan University. It is wonderful to see so many people online and it is my great honor to be the moderator of this opening session. At this year's GRASFI conference is both full of absolutely fantastic content um, and as we try to accommodate all different time zones in Asia, Africa, Europe, Africa, and the Americas, we have a very tight program and we need to stick to the schedule, of course, without too much buffer. So, and also please note that this conference will be recorded and all sessions will be made available on demand um, for you within the platform. Therefore, to save time without much ado, I want to welcome Professor Wang Yao, the host of the 2021 GRASFI Conference. Professor Yao Wang is the Director General of the International Institute of Green Finance at the Central University of Finance and Economics in Beijing. She also serves as Deputy Secretary General of the Green Finance Committee of the China Society for Finance and Banking, as advisor to the Sustainable Finance Program at the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment and at the Ox University of Oxford and as a consultant for the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Wang Yao, very great to see you here and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you around the world. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to welcome you all to uh, the fourth annual conference of the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment, GRASFI. Uh, it is an absolute honor for the International Institute of Green Finance, IIGF, at the Central University of Finance and Economics to organize a conference this year after it was successfully held at Maastricht University in 2018, the University of Oxford in 2019, and the Columbia University last year. This year is very special to the Alliance and us, as it is the first GRASFI conference hosted in the emerging economy and the first one in Asia, one of the most vibrant sustainable finance markets in the world. Uh, the Alliance was founded to promote multidisciplinary academic research on sustainable finance and investment. In this regard, uh, GRASFI plays a vital role in creating a platform that uh, nurtures academic collaboration among researchers and helps graduate students and the junior academics uh, grow their expertise in sustainable finance. Uh, despite the dynamic development of green and sustainable finance ar uh, around the global, the current financing gaps for sustainable development of emerging economies have only widened after the COVID-19 crisis. While the world is still uh, grappling with the pandemic aftermath, uh, we are already experienced devastating extreme weather events such as wildfires, floods, storms, rapid biodiversity loss, and the destruction of ecosystems, which accelerates social inequalities and directly endanger human existence on the planet. Against this backdrop, it is increasingly crucial to strengthen the dialogue between academia, industry practitioners, and the policymakers. So in this context, uh, robust and high quality academic research is fundamental to ensuring uh, that the policy and the market actors to, uh, actors are empower, empowered to make science-based decision. Additionally, we want to emphasize that only by uh, fostering uh, diversity and inclusion in academia can we drive scientific innovation and uh, tackle complex environmental and social problems for that reason. So we strive to bring together a diverse community to pr promote an open exchange of ideas and knowledge sharing during this high level virtual conference. Yesterday, uh, GRASFI PhD workshop was successfully held 
ahead of us are three days full of insightful discussions and uh, presentations with the uh, practice, uh, pra uh, participation of the world's experts uh, in sustainable finance. This year's GRASFI uh, uh, program includes keynote speeches from leading academics and practitioners, two high-level panel discussions on central banks and regulators and emerging markets finance. Uh, we have also planned 13 paper sessions featuring 39 excellent papers on climate and biodiversity finance, green bonds, financial regulations, and so on. Uh, I hope this year's GRASFI conference will inspire you future work with cutting edge research build friendships for future collaborations and give you the confidence to push the frontiers of knowledge in sustainable finance. Together, we can accelerate the alignment of the financial system with uh, climate and the biodiversity needs and drive the momentum for the two upcoming COPs uh, in Glasgow and uh, Kunming. Okay, I'm stop here. Thank you very much. Chris. Thank you, uh, thank you, Wang Yao. Um, so good to see you, and uh, so good uh, to hear your welcoming uh, remarks. Um, uh, next, uh, please give a warm welcome also to Dr. Ben Caldecott. Ben is the founding director of the Oxford Sustainable Finance Program at the University of Oxford Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, and is also the founding director and principal investigator of the UK Centre for Greening Finance and Investments, um, established by the UK Research and Innovation in 2021 as the International Center to accelerate the adoption and use of climate and environmental data by financial institutions. Since 2019, he has also been seconded to the UK Cabinet Office as the COP26 Strategy Advisor for Finance. And of course, I think most of us know Ben also as the Chair of the Grass Report. Welcome, Ben. Welcome to GRASFI 2021, the fourth annual conference of the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment. I'm Ben Caldecott from Oxford University, and I'm one of the co-founders of GRASFI. I'm also its co-chair, together with Professor Rob Bauer of Maastricht University. As a result of the pandemic, the board, together with KUFI, this year's host university, decided to move to a fully online conference for the second time. I want to commend the KUFI team for putting this together and for your willingness to participate remotely. Uh, before we get going, I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you a bit more about the Alliance. The Alliance was founded in 2017. We now have 29 member universities representing a wide range of major global and regional research universities. The University of Bologna, the oldest extant university in the world, and the University of Edinburgh, famous for Adam Smith, amongst other things, are the latest universities to join GRASFI, and they've both recently joined. Both have demonstrated a significant long-term commitment to research and teaching in sustainable finance, like all of our member universities. Now, as, a, as an alliance, we decided early on that a top priority must be to deliver a high quality international academic conference every year, the go-to conference for researchers in our emerging field. There are already many practitioner-focused conferences with academic researchers present, but very few for academics to come together and for academic discourse and field development to be the, the primary focus. So our annual conferences are first and foremost academic conferences for academics. We have agreed, however, that it's obviously important um, to have practitioners present and around 25% of the participants are practitioners, represent regulators or NGOs working on these topics, many of whom have connections to universities and academic research programs. These are obviously key research partners and provide really important perspectives for our research. Please do provide feedback during and after the conference. We'll be undertaking an initial review of what's worked this year at our AGM, and feedback will be invaluable for the organizers of next, year, next year's conference. And I'm pleased to confirm that uh, next year uh, it'll be the University of Zurich, and that will be from the 1st to the 3rd of September uh, in Zurich, in Switzerland. So please put the date in your diary. So to conclude, our growing community of academic researchers working on sustainable finance needs to be here for the long haul. The Alliance has been established to support this and to encourage a flourishing of impactful, high quality research on sustainable finance and investment. The quality of the papers reviewed for this conference suggests there is continued rapid growth in sustainable finance research and now an impressive pipeline of PhD students wanting to build careers in this field. 
It's an incredibly exciting time. So much is going on and we have a unique opportunity to shape this field of academic research. So finally, on behalf of the board, I want to thank um, our sponsors, uh, our main conference sponsor, BNP Paribas Asset Management, our paper prize sponsor, the CFA Institute Financial Analyst Journal. And I also want to thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful conference and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was a very warm, very nice welcome um, also from your side. Next, uh, please give a warm welcome to Professor Rob Bauer, the chair of the Academic Con uh, Committee of the Grassroot 2021 Conference. Rob Bauer is Professor of Finance, the chair um, uh, at, at Maastricht University School of Business and Economics in the Netherlands. Rob is also director of the European Center for Corporate Engagement at Maastricht University and executive director of the International Center for Pension Management in Toronto. Over to you, Rob. Yes, uh, thank you, Christoph. Um, I actually am uh, jointly with Ben, the co-chair and co-founders of uh, with Maastricht University and Oxford of, of Grassfi. So uh, I think I want to go back a minute to when we started, what we wanted to achieve. Uh, and one important point uh, uh, that we want to achieve in these conferences is that we come up with research that has impact. And research that has impact uh, is not just uh, research that is interesting and has great results, but it's also thorough research checked for right methodology uh, that you can infer something. Francis, to really make sure that, uh, that the pay. It seems, Rob, you, that's kind of the problem of beauty of live conferences, global live conferences. Rob is not available right now. I think we had some issues before. Rob, are you back with us? I'm back, yes. Oh, I really don't know what's going on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. No, we cannot hear you. I think until we figure this out, we will um, move to our uh, next round. And uh, hopefully Rob will join us uh, later again um, when the connection is more stable. I want to move then uh, take the opportunity to move to the keynote speeches. Rob, you will be joining later, hopefully again, to the keynote uh, speeches. And I'm absolutely excited about uh, kind of the mix that we have um, uh, uh, gathered and the, the fantastic speakers that we um, uh, could um, con invite to this, to this conference. We have uh, um, the financial sector experts um, to deliver keynote speeches. And I'm particularly excited about this, also the short lightning speeches delivered by non-financial experts. But so actual scientists concerned with climate change, biodiversity and social development to help us understand in the community what actually sustainable and green means in the finance sector. Now with that, I'm absolutely excited to introduce our first lightning keynote speaker, Emily Schuckberg. Dr. Emily Schuckberg is the director of the Cambridge Zero, the University of Cambridge major climate change initiative. She's also a reader in environmental data science at the Department of Computer Science and Technology and leads the UKRI Center for Doctoral Training on the application of AI to the study of environmental risks. She's a mathematician and climate scientist and a fellow of Darwin College, a fellow of the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership, an associate fellow of the Center for Science and Policy, a fellow of the British Antarctic Survey, and a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society. A warm welcome to you, Emily. Today, I'd like to talk about the urgency of the climate change response. We are seeing the impacts of climate change in extreme weather around the world. Wildfires, heat waves, floods, the melting of polar ice. Climate change really is here and now today. And today's atmosphere is unprecedented in terms of the levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases throughout human history, prehistory and beyond. We know this from the evidence from Antarctic ice cores. 
If we look at a dashboard of how the world has changed over the last 150 years, society has been transformed in many countries of the world, a 100-fold increase in global GDP. And much of that transformation has been driven by industrialization, powered by the use of fossil fuels, a 20-fold increase in global energy use. Fossil fuels produce greenhouse gases, and that has led to a warming of the world, a 1.1 degree Celsius increase in global temperatures and other changes to the climate system, including rising sea levels. And this is all sat on top of wider threat to nature. So collectively, we are facing both a climate and a nature emergency. Climate change is threatening lives and livelihoods around the world. And at the same time, around 1 million species are estimated at being at risk of extinction over the coming decades. The scale of change that we are inflicting on the planet is shocking. Tropical forest area, almost the size of England was lost in 2019, with a third of that being primary forest. If we don't limit our impact on the planet, the risks to people, nature and business will multiply as the warming increases. And just as one example, this is a, a plot, a graph showing the increase expected in the number of business disruption days over the coming decades as a consequence of an increase in warming with extreme heat days expected um, in many, many countries of the world. And perhaps the biggest concern is the risk of catastrophic shocks occurring as the planet warms. That might be the collapse of the vast ice sheets covering Greenland and Antarctica. It might be the switch of the Amazon rainforest from being a sink of carbon to being a source of carbon. Or it might be the release of vast stores of frozen methane from the Arctic as it warms. Now, if we're to limit the risk of those climate impacts, we need to dramatically change our emissions of greenhouse gases. This graph here shows our global emissions of carbon dioxide over the last four decades in white dots. And the pathway we need to be on if we are to have a reasonable chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. It requires halving our global emissions over this decade and reaching net zero by around about the middle of the century. But within that, there are huge opportunities for transformational change. We're already on a pathway to a green energy future. We can see the future in terms of net zero uh, transport with electric vehicles rapidly increasing in, around the world. Agriculture can be made more sustainable. We can reduce our waste and create more circular economy. Uh, buildings can be constructed and operated in zero carbon ways. We can look at industrial processes and how we can green those. And we can look to see how we can use technology and nature to remove carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So, of course, there are significant risks to businesses and investments from climate change, whether that's transition risk, physical risk or liability risk. But all of those risks can be turned around into opportunities, clean growth opportunities, the opportunity to build greater resilience and the opportunity to indeed re revision our entire mission in terms of our businesses and investments. How can our business and investments be used to support a better future for all? So in summary, climate change is here and now. The global response to date is not sufficient. Everyone has to do more. The next 10 years are critical, but this really does represent the investment opportunity of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think uh, very sobering, a strong wake up call for immediate action, but also a clear um, pathway to uh, look at some of the opportunities. Next, I would like to uh, uh, welcome Stephen Billiet. He's the CEO of APEC and head of global client group at BNP Paribas Asset Management. Stephen is armed with considerable experience in the asset management and financial services industry, 
with a career spans, um, it's hard to believe, but 27 years of which 18 years as chief executive officers roles at business entities of global organizations in Australia, Hong Kong, India, Singapore, and Taiwan. As the head of global client group, he's instrumental in spearheading the firm's business development strategy to become a leading provider of quality investments solutions for individual, corporate, and institutional investors. While maintaining focus on delivering sustainable return for clients in line with BNP Paribas Asset Management's core values and culture. A very, very warm welcome to you, Stephen. You, can you unmute yourself, I think, or somebody can unmute himself, him? Is that okay now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christopher, and uh, it's great to be here. And uh, thank you all for joining uh, the conference. And uh, clearly at, uh, at BNP Paribas Asset Management, it's, it's our pleasure to be uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, we have been supporting GrassFi uh, since the start um, because it aligns uh, very well with, with our overall aim to be a future maker and using you know, the leverage that our investments uh, and our voice bring to positively influence the world around us. Uh, so it's very much aligned with that commitment uh, and we feel indeed that uh, promoting cutting edge research and sustainable finance and investment is a, a stepping stone for a more sustainable future. Issues such as climate change, uh, biodiversity loss and social inequality. Uh, emerging academic research and hosting academic interns in our organization, we feel will help us uh, address those risks. And it will also help us solve complex issues, such as how to measure the social uh, and environmental impact of uh, investments. The uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement, the uh, 2030 Agenda, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the uh, IG Biodiversity Targets post-2020 are the frameworks that have set us all on a common path to transform life, hopefully, for everyone. Uh, but the global finance industry has a massive role to play uh, in the drive to bring about this economic and societal change uh, that we're all here to discuss at uh, the GrassFi conference. Uh, BNP Paribas Asset Management, as a committed sustainable investor, uh, you know, integrates uh, ESG factors in our decision making, uh, and that's at the core of, of what we really do uh, every day. Uh, through BNP Paribas Asset Management, sustainable uh, strategy, we've committed to take a firm-wide approach to sustainable investment across all of our assets and asset classes. So how does a large you know, investment organization such as uh, ourselves address this complicated program, uh, problem in a way that fosters genuine sustainability? Uh, I think we, uh, as a large global investor, and many of our uh, colleagues in the industry have accepted the realities that uh, sustainable uh, world and um, uh, shifting capital uh, is needed to make the transition. Uh, embedding the management of carbon into investing practice, for example, or engaging with companies in which we invest through constructive dialogue um, will help us to encourage them to follow a more sustainable path. Achieving net zero emissions has really now become the new benchmark, and we've seen that around the world, but also in Asia, growing commitments towards that goal. With also China last year announcing, you know, it would target uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. Um, and those commitments, uh, as well as the ones made at uh, the Leaders Summit on Climate uh, earlier this year, and the additional statements from uh, the U.S. government, I think, have now really boosted. Uh, momentum in this uh, net zero initiative and the finance industry um, is is definitely following that with you know more than 30 global managers asset managers saying uh, that they would uh, aim to achieve um, this net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and i think about 43 banks now also announcing plans to cut emissions uh, from their balance sheets so that's on the finance industry itself, but also the financial regulators are playing a key role in driving better standards of corporate behavior. And regulators now want to see companies come up with meaningful, achievable targets on climate and sustainability. 
So now the pressure, I think, is building on companies to become more transparent in their financial disclosures. And lobby groups are pushing for votes against the election of directors, for instance, who fail to support sustainable goals. Investors wanting to cut the carbon emission intensity of their investments are also working more closely with index providers and other uh, industry uh, players to devise passive investment strategies tied to customized client transition uh, indices. And all of these moves uh, will bring significant improvement in sustainable investing. And as time goes on, um, we should also be able to uh, start to accurately uh, measure those improvements. Now, while the pressure builds on companies to comply and to report, the challenge for investors is to gain meaningful insight from corporate ESG reporting. And although there's an increasing number of companies that publish sustainability reports, they do not systematically include quantified, standardized information or meaningful data for investors. So the metrics disclosed are often based on inconsistent uh, methodologies, and that obviously limits comparability and increases the potential of misuse or misunderstanding. Uh, so the collective uh, endeavors there amongst investors, including you know, passive investors, is definitely the key to changing that behavior. And amidst all the new complexity of sustainability reporting, good communication will remain critical. It's important that companies and big investors clearly and transparently tell the community what steps they're taking to meet the sustainable development goals. At BNP Paribas Asset Management, uh, we've uh, been a leader in that sustainable investment uh, philosophy and it clearly something that we feel has been recognized uh, globally. We're top ranked uh, amongst the major asset managers for our responsible investment approach in, in share actions, uh, point of no returns report. And in 2019, we became the first global manager uh, um, to commit to integrate sustainable investment across the full range uh, of our strategies. Uh, in our principles of uh, sustainable investment uh, latest assessment report, the uh, BNP Paribas Asset Management uh, received a top uh, A plus rating in five out of the seven modules, including for strategy and, and governance modules. So we're very much dedicated uh, to uh, sustainable investing um, and, and get recognition there from external parties. Uh, what we do as an active shareholder um, as well is, is really to take stock on a regular basis on, on how we vote, in particular on issues around climate change, on board diversity, uh, for instance, as, as focus areas. Uh, and we can sort of report on that as well. Uh, we, we have for um, the 2021 season of uh, general uh, meetings uh, opposed 34% of resolutions, uh, which is you know a rate that has been increasing year after year. Uh, we also opposed to 700 resolutions specifically for climate reasons. And these were cases where you know, companies were just not properly reporting on their carbon footprint or didn't communicate or want to engage constructively on mitigating and adapting to climate change. And so the growth in climate-related uh, resolutions filed by shareholders like ourselves show that you know, we've reached a major turning point in, in how companies are run. Climate and sustainability are now top of the agenda, and we uh, expect that to continue to rise and have an impact on um, uh, general meetings at companies for years to come. So engagement can be a powerful tool uh, to drive sustainable change, and that engagement needs to intensify, because ultimately companies will have to be divested if they cannot demonstrate a willingness or an, ab an ability to transition. Uh, but engagement and disclosures are not just going to deliver uh, the targets. The next decade, we feel, is going to be dominated by portfolio investment decisions. Investors need to be better informed on the impact of their decisions. Uh, just as an example, biodiversity impact is currently not perceived by the market as a material risk. And as a result, investors still hold assets with high biodiversity risk and impact in their portfolios. So the complexity of this problem really highlights why it's important for policymakers and investors to precisely map and quantify uh, and analyze the environmental and social impact of their activities. And creating investable assets, bonds and funds uh, that can be directed at the problem is also key to unlocking a sustainable future 
challenging capital you know, to green technologies and infrastructure. As the market deepens uh, for sustainable we link loans and green bonds, we can also expect to see uh, most radical changes in areas such as climate resilient infrastructure, renewable in, uh, energy, uh, electric transport, uh, digital uh, agriculture, for example. Moving maybe on to more uh, uh, geographical uh, topics, so China also has an important role to play. Uh, and it's working to mobilize uh, a massive green investment program. Uh, the People's Bank of China plans to develop um, a mandatory disclosure system that will require all financial institutions and firms to follow a uniform disclosure methodology. It's working with the European Union to harmonize uh, green taxonomies. Uh, and recently, uh, this year, on, uh, in April, the Chinese authorities issued an updated catalog uh, of economic activities eligible uh, to be financed by green bonds. You know, it completely excludes coal and other fossil fuels from green activities, uh, even clean use of such fuels. So this is a clear signal of China's policy intention to direct capital raised from green bonds to support the transition away from fossil fuels uh, towards low carbon projects. And China accounts for about a third of the world's CO2 emissions. So if China can live up to this promise to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2060, it will have contributed uh, significantly uh, to global uh, change in this space. Um, according to the latest Convention of Biological Diversity report, it uh, costs about uh, over 100 billion um, and about 895 billion annually uh, to support the uh, global bi biodiversity framework. So these figures are, you know, big, but they're dwarfed by the current financial flows into activities which harm biodiversity. So, you know, particularly the incentives in, in agriculture, fossil fuels and fisheries. So preserving biodiversity and restoring ecosystems uh, really represents a, a very large investment opportunity. And according to the World Economic Forum, business opportunities from aquatic, terrestrial and urban ecosystem restoration amount to no less than 60 trillion in the decade to 2030. So that's a massive opportunity for institutional capital uh, to be used um, in, in a very supportive way. And so the momentum is building and that's you know, the good news. Uh, global investments are following uh, one or more of the uh, sustainable investment approaches and, and they've grown a lot to now about 35 trillion in professionally managed assets, which is about you know, 30% of all the assets across the US, Canada, Japan, Australia, Asia, and, and Europe. So with these numbers, um, there's still a, a lot of promising progress, but we feel that there's still too much of um, vague policymaking, uh, greenwashing and, and inconsistency in reporting uh, or responsible investing standards. So the trend for sustainable investing is gathering pace and institutional investors and wealthy families have started to recognize thematic investment opportunities such as renewables. Uh, and are putting more emphasis on, on you know, thematic uh, investments uh, uh, such as alternative energy and the broader energy transition teams. And as a result, energy, uh, alternative energies is poised to benefit from the massive uh, investments needed you know, for the transition to a Paris aligned uh, economic model. Uh, global pledges to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 have opened up renewable energy and infrastructure opportunities for investors, demand is strong for large-scale wind and solar power assets and hydrogen alternatives and anything related to you know, climate tech. Uh, for example, the power generation in, in Asia accounts still for almost a quarter of all global greenhouse gas emissions. And so to replace that uh, as part of the move towards net zero uh, shows the opportunities that it can create uh, for the overall renewable sector, as well as for the you know, broader infrastructure that supports it. So ultimately, there's still little doubt that the energy transition will shape economies going forward. And investor appetite is, is really uh, an evidence of this, uh, with the trend towards ESG solutions riding on growing environmental awareness uh, that, that also has accelerated you know, during the COVID pandemic. And this is supported by observable changes around the world. A recent survey by Boston Consulting Group, for instance, found that 70% of Respondents now are more interested in environmental challenges and are more committed 
to changing their own behavior you know, to advance sustainability. And so in line with this, investment in ESG funds uh, hit an all-time high in 2020 with 347 billion of inflows and 700 new funds launched globally. Uh, and that's not only uh, in the rest of the world, also in Asia, um, we're catching up with uh, now 37 billion in assets under management across sustainable funds at the end of 2020, which is a rise of from about 20 billion only six months before. So it is a lot of change, but we still feel it falls short of the required estimate uh, investments of potentially more than 3 trillion to achieve global climate goals. So growth has been strong, but from a very low base, and there's still a lot of room uh, for more growth in this space. So meeting broad and effective sustainability targets will continue to require huge changes to the global economy in terms of energy mix, consumption, housing, human behavior in general. So it's vital that the largest investing institutions globally, like ourselves, do all they can to help society evolve in positive ways. And that will ensure a more sustainable future. So with that, I thank you for uh, listening and I hope you all have a fantastic uh, conference ahead. Thank you. Thank you, so Stephen. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that you covered a lot of ground in your speech, gave a lot of uh, hope also in the direction that we're going, a lot of uh, support also in the research that we should embark on. I think you highlighted also um, uh, particularly biodiversity, where uh, solutions are uh, wanting, um, but are being developed as uh, we are speaking. We just had also concluded the biodiversity um, <coughs> side event of uh, Grassley and with one of your colleagues participating as well. So thank you again uh, for joining and thank you so much for your support. Next, I would like to welcome uh, our speaker for the next lightning uh, 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 keynote speech on social development, Kobus van Staden. Kobus van Staden is a senior researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Um, he's, uh, he's focusing on Africa-China relations at the, uh, the South African Institute of International Affairs. He's also the co-host on the China and Africa podcast. Listen in if you don't. Um, and the director of research and analysis at the China Africa project. Uh, very, very warm welcome to you, Kobus. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kubis von Staden. Um, I'm a researcher on China and Africa relations at the South African Institute of International Affairs. And I also run a project called the China Africa Project, where we focus on the, the entire breadth of China's engagement in the global south and particularly in Africa. So I'm incredibly honored to have been invited to, to deliver this message uh, to the Grassley Conference. Um, it's, it's, it's really amazing to speak with all of you. Um, Christoph asked me to, to particularly comment on, on the, the social impact of, of sustainable financing. So just to give you an idea of, of the kind of context within which I'm speaking, um, I'm South African. Um, I'm speaking to you from Johannesburg. Um, as you no doubt saw a few months ago, South Africa was overrun by violent protests um, and widespread looting, um, which really put a dent to the national economy, uh, uh, an economy that's already been dented by, um, by a lot of corruption and by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So South Africa this week release new unemployment uh, numbers, which puts it in the, it, it, it's now has the highest unemployment numbers in the world. Um, so this is this kind of slow moving wildfire. It's a slow moving train wreck um, in the country. It's in incredibly destructive. It's incredibly worrying. Um, and this is exactly the kind of thing that, that, uh, that sustainable financing and that the experts that work on it should consider. Um, you know, when we talk about social inclusion, um, our, we, we tend to think a lot about skills transfer, we tend to think a lot about training, and those things are really important. It, it is important to create jobs, it's important to, to train people, and the more internationally financed projects can do that, the better. But what we're looking at to solve this issue is a lot more radical. Um, we need to 
to find new ways of engaging the community with particularly young people. So in so Africa, as everyone knows, Africa has a very young population. Um, and the, the average age of, of, of an African is around 19. Um, so think of yourself at 19. Think of, think of the, the kind of things that you wanted to do, the things that you, that you the, the places you wanted to enter. Um, and I, I hazard a guess that, that many people listening to this, you know, could have had some access um, to spaces of education, of employment, to internships, to, to kind of ways to make those first steps kind of going forward. Young people in, in, in South Africa don't have that access. Um, and no one is really stepping up to give them that access. And this is even more true in other parts of Africa. Um, so, you know, kind of what, what we've seen in South Africa is th that there's, there's a limit to how long people can just absorb exclusion. Um, it's, you know, kind of at some stage it blows up. Um, and when it does, it takes whole chunks of the economy with it. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the chaos in South Africa was, you know, in international coverage of it was, was ascribed to, um, to leadership issues um, in, in, in the government and, and, and different groups of kind of being loyal to the previous president and to the current president. And that is true. However, it's been growing and gaining momentum for decades and decades. Um, the real thing that, that caused the chaos wasn't necessarily the particular kind of political issues of the day, but it was the structural exclusion of large parts of the, of the population. And the way that they are excluded is by simply not getting any chances, like not getting any stakeholdership, not getting any new skills. Um, so this is what we need to think about um, on, in sustainable financing going forward. Not only how can we maximize skills transfer, how can we maximize the involvement in local employment and local procurement, but Mar, we need to be to think much wider and, and much more kind of in a, in a much more radical way about how can we stop this kind of slow moving wildfire that's that's consuming global style societies um, and how can we take how can we make the best use of this incredible amount of human capital that's kind of currently kind of rolling around with, with no no destination um, when when people's talents are used they can achieve amazing things. When they're not used, the kind of degradation and, and kind of personal disempowerment that comes with it tends to poison everything, even those talents. Um, and it, it certainly tends to then poison the societies where these people live. And they tend to then cause ongoing knock-on problems because, because people can only live so long in a certain place without hope before they decide to move. Um, and the next, the next step is, you know, kind of is racism in Europe, et cetera, et cetera, right? Kind of so, so all of these, these, these systems are enmeshed and they're all woven together. Um, and it is the responsibility of people like us who work in international development, international finance, to find ways of, of solving this problem, because this is as big a problem as climate change, for example, right? Kind of an, and with climate change, we're now used to thinking that, well, what we need to do, among other things, is massive institutional reform. You know, the way that we do business um, on all kind of counts on, you know, in agriculture, in making cement, in, you know, kind of transportation, all of these things have to change in order to, to for us to make it through climate change semi-intact. Um, the same is true for social inclusion and for social investment. Um, without adequate social investment, all of our other mitigation measures, including in climate change, including in health, including in education even, will go to waste. Because the, the, the way that, that a lack of inclusion, the way that it kind of rewires societies and the way that the, the kind of logics that it supports, including kind of corruption and other forms of kind of scarcity logics, end up be making the implementation of other mitigation measures impossible. Um, so this is what we have to think about. Like we have to find a way of including these people, like finding ways of, of, of redefining uh, what value through work means, um, redefining what what employment looks like, um, and you know, kind of, and, and starting to think in really radical, innovative ways 
about how, how to move forward, taking everyone with us. So thanks so much. Um, enjoy the conference. Thanks so much for this invitation. I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to contribute this message. And yes, thanks so much. And uh, I look forward to speaking soon. Kobus, thank you so much. Um, that was a very inspiring, heartbreaking, um, but also a very important speech. I think with sustainable finance focusing on the triple bottom line, not just economic returns, this speech really highlights the social stress. Also, of course, some opportunities that we in the sustainable finance research and business community have to ensure to include a true witness story. Next, I would like to welcome for our next keynote speech, uh, Ms. Armida Salcia Alice Yabana. She's the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, also known as UNESCO. Ms. Uh, Armida Salcia Alice Yabana was appointed Executive Secretary um, of UNESCO on, uh, in September 2018. Since 2016, she has served as Director for the Center of Sustainable Development Goal Studies at Universidad Padjaran, sorry for the mispronunciation, and Vice Chair of the Indonesian Academy of Sciences. From 2009 to 2014, she was Minister of National Development Planning and the head of the National Development Planning Agency in Indonesia. The floor is yours. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to join you here at the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment 2021 conference. I would like to thank the International Institute of Green Finance of the Central University of Finance and Economics for hosting this important event. Aligning financial markets with environmental, social, and governance criteria is essential in addressing the daunting challenge faced by climate change. Concrete actions, including the financing of green and sustainable solutions, have never been more urgent. As countries prioritize a speedy economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a risk that financial flows are diverted from sustainable finance initiatives. It is paramount that sustainable finance remains a top priority both for government and businesses as we work towards economic recovery. At ESCAP, we are supporting our member states through data gathering, research, capacity building, and technical assistance to institute policies, mechanisms, and procedures that would assist the transition to a low-carbon future. There are several innovative financing strategies and mechanisms which we are advocating, including the issuance of thematic bonds, specifically green bonds. There already has been a substantial rise in the issuance of thematic bonds in recent years. However, the lack of a clear framework and associated policies for issuing green bonds remains a significant barrier. Therefore, it is important that countries adopt recognized international standards and green bond frameworks, such as the green bond principles. It is equally important to establish methodologies to verify the environmental and social impacts of the projects financed by such bonds. Similarly, climate risk disclosure and reporting are also critical. Incentivizing investors and businesses to factor in climate risk in their decision making allows financial flows to align with climate objectives. Additionally, Alternative innovative financing instruments, such as debt for climate swaps, have the potential to help simultaneously tackle challenges related to insufficient financial flows for climate action and debt sustainability. However, facilitating such a swap is complex. ESCAP is working with partners to analyze and identify the fundamental characteristics of success in negotiating such a swap. In closing, it is heartening to see such a robust coalition of academic research institutions alongside policymakers and the private sector. I hope this conference will inspire debate, peer learning, and action. Additionally, as this event brings together university scholars, 
who will become future experts on sustainable finance. I hope this event inspires our youth to innovate, take action, and become the leaders and climate champions of tomorrow. I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Armida. Thank you for your uh, warm message uh, that's well received. And I also believe that uh, it's not only, of course, the uh, experts already in the field, but also the youth that has to be mobilized in order to become experts in the sustainable finance field. Next, uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Vitor Gaspar. He's the director of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, um, since 2014. He was also Portuguese Minister of State and Finance from 2011 to 2013, and has held various positions in European and Portuguese institutions, including head of BIPA at the European Commission, Director General of Research at the European Central Bank, Director of Economic Studies and Statistics at the Central Bank of Portugal, and Director of Economic Studies at the Portuguese Ministry of Finance. A very warm welcome to you, Vitor. Good morning or good afternoon. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to contribute to the fourth annual conference of the Global Research Alliance for Finance and Investment, uh, GRASFI. And I am Vitor Gaspar from the Fiscal Affairs Department uh, of the IMF. In this uh, presentation, I will start by giving the motivation of why climate change is micro, macro critical for the International Monetary Fund. How do we see the policy response uh, to climate change with an emphasis on carbon uh, pricing? but looking at complementarities between carbon pricing and other instruments. The third part of the presentation would be on the political economy of uh, policies uh, to fight climate change, the aspect of enhancing acceptability. I'm unlikely to have time to cover that section and then I will conclude. Now, the starting point is uh, well known to all participants uh, in this uh, conference. And what we see is a uh, chart from the Oxford Environmental Change uh, Institute that shows in blue that the balance between natural warming and cooling would lead to a very flat path for uh, temperatures on average worldwide. But that's not what we have been observing. What we have been observing is a steady increase. And we see that the dominant driver of uh, this trend is uh, human activities on Earth. So that's our starting point. Now, this uh, global uh, warming has been associated with headlines uh, reporting on extreme weather events. And there is suggestive evidence that the incidence of extreme weather events is uh, related to global warming. And I will elaborate a little bit more on this later on. I will spend a little bit more time on this slide and I really ask for your attention because I do believe it's an important uh, point. I want to make uh, five points, I believe. The first is very obvious. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side, uh, you do see that the impacts of a 3.5 degrees Celsius increase in uh, temperature is associated with a estimated and simulated decline in uh, GDP uh, per capita, and that effect accumulates over time. So climate change is adverse to uh, economic uh, performance. 
On the right hand side, you see that that's not the only problem. Another uh, important problem is that the incidence of uh, this economic uh, costs falls more heavily on the poorest uh, segments of the population, while the uh, richest are actually able to cope uh, reasonably well with the impacts from climate change in these uh, simulations. Now, clearly, a second aspect, which is very clear from the left-hand side of the slide, is that the uncertainty associated with the impacts of climate change is uh, very high. We're not very precise in our estimates of uh, consequences uh, from climate change on a GDP per capita. And of course, the uh, aspects that were uh, reflected in these simulations are basically impacts through the path of productivity growth, investment accumulation, and other economic variables. The fact that these uh, models do not take in, into account uh, possible tipping points in the equilibrium of uh, natural uh, environments suggests that the amount of uncertainty, huge as it is, is a very strong underestimate. And this point about uncertainty is uh, crucial. The third point uh, that I want to make is that, as it was clear from the first slide that I presented, the link between uh, green ga gas uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, global warming is not controversial. And the models that we have uh, to represent uh, this relation have proven quite accurate. However, it does seem that the models that do relate increases in temperature with the incidence of extreme weather effects may have actually underestimated the uh, impacts of uh, increase in temperature on the weather, and in particular, extreme weather effects. So again, uh, uncertainty is uh, pervasive and it is likely to be even uh, more important. This is a uh, radical change. It is a systemic change. And so the, it is necessary uh, to uh, model uh, explicitly both the impacts on economic and finance and also continue research on the uh, initial process of global warming and its uh, propagation through the various uh, relevant uh, natural uh, environments. So moving now on, we see that business as usual is not going to be to enable us uh, to fight and limit uh, climate change. On the contrary, things would get substantially uh, worse. We see that the national defined contributions in the climate agreement would lead to a uh, substantial decline in CO2 emissions, but not any place near what is necessary to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius and even further away from 1.5 degrees Celsius. But the main point from uh, this slide is a different one. You see clearly uh, from the slide that the type of adjustment that we will have to undertake in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, in the next 30 years uh, is uh, quite pronounced. And the sooner uh, we get uh, to net zero, the sooner we're going to be able to contain uh, global warming, and the more we are going to be able to uh, control the process of uh, climate change. And uh, you see in this chart that if you group countries into advanced economies, emerging market economies, and low-income countries, you see that the participation of 
uh, emerging market economies in any uh, global effort is crucial uh, for effectiveness in the fight against climate change. Without the mobilization of emerging market economies, the efforts, say, by advanced economies alone would be uh, dramatically insufficient. More on this uh, to follow. Now, given the radical change uh, that we are talking about, a change in a uh, technological uh, paradigm is uh, necessary. And that involves the diffusion of existing commercial proven uh, technologies. And you have an illustration on the chart on the right hand side of the chart. And of course, the fusion of existing commercial proven low carbon technologies is going to be decisive for uh, what's going to happen from now until 2030. As we widen the uh, time horizon, uh, new technologies become increasingly important and incentives for innovation uh, also. And that clearly underlines the importance of uh, carbon pricing as carbon pricing uh, facilitates both the adoption of existing uh, technologies but also nudges uh, innovation and research and development expenditure towards new greener technologies that are crucial for a successful transition. Now, there are good examples of success stories and the example of phasing out of coal in the United Kingdom is uh, one such an example. In the case of the United Kingdom, there was a moderate uh, carbon price that was uh, adopted. There was a carbon price floor. And that carbon price floor, as you can see on the right hand side, pushed the carbon price uh, above the level that prevailed in Europe in general. And as you can see on the lower panel, also on the right hand side, uh, the contribution of uh, uh, coal to the uh, productions, to the production of energy was lowered from 42% in 2012 to 7% uh, in 2017. And this is quite remarkable given that we're talking about uh, five years. And that does show the power of uh, carbon uh, pricing to accelerate the transition. Now, this slide is one that we from the International Monetary Fund have uh, shown many times. You know now from the first uh, slide that we are already about 1.2 degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial uh, levels. The range in the Paris Agreement is in yellow between 1.5 and 2 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, in order to attend to limit uh, global warming to 2 degrees Celsius, we need a carbon tax of $75 per ton by uh, 2030 or equivalent in order to limit uh, to 1.5 we need to go even further again uh, you immediately perceive that we're talking about radical transformation how can we bring it about to our mind uh, carbon pricing is at the center of the instruments that are most promising and you can see in this slide that we have already 30 national schemes uh, around the world. There are good examples of uh, recent uh, adoption, but the global average price per ton is only $3 per ton. And the coverage of the schemes uh, is also 
substantially less than what we would advise. Carbon pricing not only has uh, impact on uh, the uh, climate change dynamics, but has uh, quite substantial uh, impact on other sustainable uh, development goals and the impact that it has on other uh, sustainable development goals operates to its impact on development and its impact on uh, public finances. We have looked at this issue in reasonable detail, as you can guess uh, from uh, this slide, but we simply do not have time to go through the details, but the details matter. The details are very important. Now, carbon pricing is necessary, but definitely not sufficient in many uh, sectors. Uh, for example, transports and buildings, other instruments are uh, necessary. The, for example, the carbon price, which would be necessary to achieve Germany's emission redu reduction targets for transports and buildings would be about $180 uh, dollars, uh, per ton. And that would be above the range of estimates uh, that uh, have been put forward as uh, reasonable for uh, carbon uh, prices or carbon taxation. So complementary uh, instruments are necessary. These uh, complementary uh, instruments can be uh, standards and uh, regulations. Uh, the fund has investigated the impacts of a fee baits uh, that allow one to keep the incentives at the margin while reducing the incidence on households and uh, corporations. Public investment is extremely important and we have studied it both in the fiscal monitor and the world economic outlook. The liberalization of energy markets and the reliance of a market mechanism is uh, very important, but uh, in order to buy uh, political consensus and contribute to a just transition, it is important to look at distributional impacts of the various uh, policy instruments used and correct the uh, un unwanted uh, effects from the climate change uh, policies. Now we have been arguing that the carbon price is not only an important instrument at the level of each individual countries, it's actually a very important instrument for uh, international coordination because it is transparent and easy uh, to monitor and it allows the concentration of negotiations on a single uh, dimension. So a, a carbon price floor by major emitters uh, would go an extremely long way uh, towards a global approach to fighting uh, climate change. Now, emerging market economies would have strong incentives uh, to uh, join such an agreement because they're affected by the uh, global externality because a global cooperative approach helps in uh, ensuring that there are no uh, disturbances to world trade and uh, that a uh, border carbon adjustment can be uh, limited or even uh, avoided. The local externalities associated with the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are very large in some of the dominant emerging market uh, economies, but there is also the possibility of financial incentives for emerging market uh, participation. And of course, the uh, revenues associated with carbon pricing would help 
in this direction. As I feared, I do not have time to go through the political economy aspects of the reform. In order to get it, carbon pricing needs to be complemented by uh, many instruments that I've only uh, referred to uh, in passing, but the slides uh, with some uh, interesting details uh, will be uh, available for your perusal. And I conclude, I try to persuade you that carbon pricing is a core policy instrument for mitigating mitigation strategies at the national level. Now, I've also argued that carbon pricing is a good way to foster uh, international cooperation and a global approach to climate change. Our estimates point that a global carbon price at around uh, $75 by 2030 is necessary to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. But carbon uh, taxes, carbon prices are not all. We need a comprehensive strategy that encompasses other instruments, including standards and regulations. We have also emphasized the importance of fee baits. Following such a comprehensive instrument, such a comprehensive strategy, based on a range of instruments is even more necessary to limit global warming to one and a half degree. The additional revenue should be used to promote inclusive growth and gather social and political support. A low carbon society does provide local benefits and those local benefits make uh, carbon pricing in the country's own best interest, even if considered in isolation. And coming from the Fiscal Affairs Department of the International Monetary Fund, the conclusion that I want to emphasize the most is that a solid fiscal groundwork is the foundation to build forward better. Thank you so much for your attention. Vitor Gaspar, thank you so much for this very, very in-depth uh, description of, first of all, where we are in terms of the um, climate impacts on our economy, and of course, also on the instruments um, that we can apply and their effectiveness um, to mitigate uh, climate uh, risks. Thank you so much for that. Next up, um, also a very exciting and uh, important speech, um, a lightning speech by Terry Townsend, a fellow at the Paulson Institute and a Beijing-based wildlife conservationist with a background in environmental economics and environmental law. He's a fellow of the Paulson Institute and in 2020 co-authored, and I think many of you have read this, uh, this report, a groundbreaking study called Financing Nature, Closing the Biodiversity Finance Gap. Um, so, very excited to have you here. Terry, you are going to give us a lightning speech on the biodiversity aspects uh, that we have to consider um, as the uh, sustainable finance specialist. A very warm welcome to you, Terry. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christoph, and thank you to Gresby for the invitation um, to speak at the opening of this important event. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I hope you can all see that. So I, I suspect that uh, when most people think of sustainable finance, they think of investment in low carbon energy uh, goods and services in order to tackle climate change, and that's reasonable. However, there is another environmental crisis that, although it's not receiving as much attention as yet, um, it is growing and has the potential to be an even bigger threat to human prosperity. Um, and that issue of, is, of course, biodiversity loss. And just to outline the scale of what we have done and what we are doing to nature, um, here are a few facts. 
So in the, in the last 50 years, it's estimated, uh, it, which is the, in the blink of an eye, in evolutionary terms, it's estimated that the populations of vertebrates have fallen by an average of 68%. And the extinction rate of species is estimated to be up to 1,000 times the natural rate. Uh, and today it's estimated that around 70% of all the birds in the world are chickens and 96% of all mammals are humans or the livestock on which we rely for food. And if we continue on this trajectory, we face a future where between 30 and 50% of all species may be lost by the middle of this century. And although research into the risks of biodiversity loss is way behind that of climate change, there is increasing evidence that biodiversity loss prevent, pre presents tremendous risks to human prosperity. And I'd like to highlight two specific risks. The first is economic. So our economy, of course, relies on nature and the services it provides. And one small example, which is often cited, that's relatively easy to quantify, is the value of our pollinators. And that's the bats, the birds, the insects, including bees, uh, that we rely on to pollinate our crops. And if we were to lose these, and we're well on the way to doing so through our overuse of pesticides, it would cost the global economy more than 200 billion US dollars. And that is one tiny example. Uh, and for every value that we can measure in terms of nature services, there are many, many more that we cannot. But what is clear is the scale of our reliance on nature. So a recent study by the World Economic Forum estimated that 44 trillion US dollars, which is over half of the global economy, is highly or moderately dependent on nature. And of course, ultimately, all economic activity depends on clean air, clean water and a habitable climate. Now, the second risk is public health. So there's growing scientific evidence to show that biodiversity loss puts people into contact with stressed ecosystems in a way that increases the risk of transmission of zoonotic diseases. And it's probably no coincidence that in the last few decades of rapid biodiversity loss, we've seen the emergence of SARS, MERS, Ebola, and of course SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus responsible for COVID-19 and the devastation that that has wreaked across the world. And it is likely that as we understand more about the complexity of nature and the magnitude of the risks, we may realize that biodiversity loss, in fact, presents risks on an even greater scale than climate change. And of course, as with most risks we face in life, the rational response is to hedge. And in the case of biodiversity loss, that means a comprehensive worldwide effort to appropriately value, protect and restore nature. Now, some people say, hang on, you know, let's focus on one thing at a time. Uh, when we fixed our policies on climate change, we can then focus on biodiversity loss. But that would be a mistake. Not only is the biodiversity crisis urgent, but climate policies could, if not well planned, exacerbate biodiversity risks. So just to give two examples, we all want to see a transition to clean energy. However, clean energy infrastructure has a land footprint that is up to 12 times larger than traditional energy. And a recent report from TNC suggests that clean energy infrastructure is actually the biggest threat to pristine habitat in North America. And second, there are now many countries around the world committing to carbon neutrality, most notably, of course, China's recent commitment to reach net zero by 2060. Undoubtedly, this is going to require a lot of offsets. And one of the most popular ways to offset emissions is to plant trees. Now, planting trees is good, right? Well, not necessarily. Tree planting, if it's not well planned, has the potential to harm biodiversity if trees are planted on grasslands or wetlands, which are valuable ecosystems and carbon sinks in their own right. And there are plenty of cases where trees have been planted on any open space, resulting in loss of biodiversity. But the good news is that with careful planning, we can tackle climate change and biodiversity loss together. Now, I want to end with this, which is just a growing body of evidence about the biodiversity risks. Um, Christoph mentioned the Financing Nature Report by the Paulson Institute and TNC and Cornell University. There are others too, the Dasgupta Review into the Economics of Biodiversity from the UK government, the UNEP-WEF Report Economics of Land Degradation, 
and also nature risk rising. And just as many countries and companies are planning to align with the Paris Agreement, it will be necessary also to align with the Kuming Agreement, which is due to be finalized at the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity COP15 in China uh, next year. So I think I'll end there and hand back to you, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, again, um, really highlighting the urgency of uh, addressing also the biodiversity uh, aspect in green finance. So thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, obviously some very sovereign data as well on the biodiversity, and the necessity to include biodiversity into financial decision making. Now, a slight uh, change in program, also to stay not too, to not to, to fall not too far behind. Um, Barbara Buchner's uh, speech um, will be available um, online on demand, um, and I would like to give the floor now to Rob Bauer um, to uh, share uh, some more remarks, particularly on the academic um, side of the conference. Yes, thank you, Christoph. This is my second try. I tried at the beginning of this session, didn't work. Uh, maybe because of the floods we had in the Netherlands, I'm in the epicenter of that. And so it's all very much related to what we just saw. My Wi-Fi was unstable. Hopefully this works. Uh, I just wanna not use too much of your time. We have an academic committee at Grasfee um, that selects uh, in the end, the paper and the program. And of course we do not do this on our own. The committee uh, exists, uh, consists of uh, Christoph Nederpil that you just saw as a moderator, Kirsten Lopata from the University of Hamburg and myself, and a ton of reviewers across the globe and both from Grasfee members and non Grasfee member universities as we wanted to have specialized uh, reviewers for each paper. And we are about to start with the paper presentations uh, in a minute. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's important to know what was the background of all of this. We, we got more than 150 submissions. Um, many of those papers were mature. Some of them were less mature, uh, but had a great idea. And out of that, we selected jointly with the reviewers 39 papers that will be presented and some PhD papers uh, on top of that. Uh, these were outside the 150. So I'm really pleased with the program, with the, with the content, but also with the quality of the, of the, of the, the papers that are being presented. Uh, and also the topical variation. It, it really goes from asset pricing to preference measurement, uh, to development finance, to uh, green banks, green financing, I mean, central banks, uh, you name it, sustainable finance and investment related in all kinds of facets. And of course, uh, because uh, people did so much, uh, put so much effort in writing all these papers, there are also some awards. We will award these prizes that we have at the end of the, of the, of the, of the program on Friday. Uh, and uh, we, will, we will definitely uh, see some of you back and also some of you that present we will reach out to you that you maybe can be there at the prize ceremony. Um, so we will have a prize for the best paper award. We will have a prize for the best PhD paper. We'll also have a prize for the best sustainable investment uh, paper. I will tell you more about the exact sponsors and the exact uh, papers during this prize session. Um, but I think uh, before I go uh, and end this, this talk, I again would like to really commend the, the team of, uh, of KUFE and the uh, IIGF. Uh, so Wang Yao, Christoph, uh, Nedupil, and his whole team, lots of people working around them uh, for organizing this and uh, the whole process to get to a program. And also at the back, uh, there is uh, Patricia Ferrari running the show. And that's a lot of work, I can tell you. So I would like to thank all of you for doing that and I would like to thank all of the people that present for bringing all your great papers to this conference. I uh, hope to see you during the sessions. Good luck everyone. Rob, thank you so much. Uh, always a pleasure and uh, thank you also for your support as the chair of the academic uh, committee and of course also um, as the co-chair of Grassfield. Now we're closing uh, the opening session and uh, next up will be 
the first uh, panel, um, which will have on central banks and regulators. So you will be, uh, this, this session will be closed and you will be asked to rejoin the next session if you are staying directly in CVENT. So thank you so much again for all the speakers. Thank you so much uh, for the audience for listening in and have a wonderful Grassroot 2021. Thank you very much.